All right. Well, this morning, we are in week two of our series on the book of Exodus. And week one was an introduction to the book. And we saw that in the very first few verses of Exodus, the stage is set for the rest of the drama that will unfold in the book. We see that great persecution had fallen upon God's people. And Pharaoh used slavery and harsh oppression, but God's people continued to grow. They continued to multiply. We know from later in the book of Exodus and in the book of Numbers that the 70 people that first came to Egypt with Jacob and his family were now 2 million people by the time they were to leave, Ex leave Egypt in the Exodus. So Pharaoh's strategy is not working. His persecution is not working. The slavery is not working. So he turns to an even more evil plan. And today we'll pick up the story in Exodus 1, starting in verse 15. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Puah, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and let the male children live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and grew very strong and because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Okay, before we move on to Exodus chapter 2 and the birth of Moses, let's talk a little bit about the midwives here in chapter 1. I've titled this sermon, Hands of Love. So obviously I have stolen this title from the mission organization in Uganda that we are involved with, Hands of Love Ministry. But it's appropriate for this sermon because the text that we are looking at today is all about how God protected his children and how he tenderly delivers them from the enemy. Pharaoh had commanded genocide. But God would deliver his children. And they needed hands of love to come and deliver them. So this is a horrible, terrible situation. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. Now, thanks to archaeology, we know how Egyptian women gave birth because there's lots of carvings from everyday life in Egypt, and there's many that show how women gave birth in Egypt. This is an ancient birth stool, and it would sit about six inches off the ground, and the women would actually squat down like this, and I guess with the help of gravity, they would give birth. And you can see some of the advance in their medical as well because there's all these instruments on this same uh, cave drawing or drawing here that showed glass jars and scissors and forceps and needles and all sorts of medical supplies that would be used in the birthing process. Well, Pharaoh's plan is that while the women are recovering immediately after the delivery, if it was a boy, the midwives were to kill the boy immediately. And it would appear to everyone that the child just died during childbirth. 
It wouldn't be that uncommon. So Pharaoh's plan is to secretly murder the innocent. It's pure evil. You don't get any more evil than Pharaoh. Slavery and killing babies. That is Pharaoh. And that's why the Jewish people prayed fervently for God to set them free from this evil. But God doesn't just drop a deliverer into their lap. God answers their prayer the way God almost always does. And that is through the faithfulness of his people. Through the faithful acts of people. By the way, this is why being part of a church family is so important and so exciting because God works through his people. When he wants to touch the world, when he wants to reach the community, it is through his people that he chooses to do it. So what we do really does matter. God always works through the hands and feet of his people. And that is just as true today as it was back in the book of Exodus. In our text today, we'll see that beginning with the midwives, there are many hands of love that play very important roles in, in the way God's plan unfolds. Each of the people that we read about has a choice. They can either obey God or they can obey Pharaoh. And there's this principle in Scripture that we are to obey the authorities that God puts over us. We are to obey the king. We are to obey the Pharaoh of the land, except when what he commands contradicts a command of God. We saw this in the New Testament when the apostles were released from prison and the authorities set them free, and they said, you can go free, but you cannot preach about Jesus anymore. And what did the apostles say? In Acts 5, Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than man. Well, the midwives do the same thing in this story. They've been commanded to kill all the baby boys but the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. Now, it is not easy to disobey Pharaoh. He is all-powerful in the land. He is seen as a god. This is how one of his rulers addressed him in just a correspondence that was found. To the king, my lord, my god, the sun, the sun from the sky, from the ruler of Gezer, your servant, the dirt at your feet, I indeed prostrate, prostrate myself at the feet of my king, my lord, my god. That's how a ruler saw Pharaoh. You did not disobey the commands of of Pharaoh. And yet, these two women did. Why? Why? Notice two very important words in the text. The midwives feared God. There was something inside of them that was deeper than any place that Pharaoh could touch. And I want to say more about that when we get to the end of this message and when we look at Pharaoh's daughter. But for now, I just want you to see that these two women, Shipra and Pua, feared God more than they feared the king. And they are two of the relatively unknown heroes of the Bible. In fact, as far as I can tell, these are two of the first pro-life heroes in the world. 
right here in our story. Because they feared God more than they feared man, they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? And let the male children live. See, Pharaoh's whole plan depended on the midwives being there at the delivery. And if they were to arrive too late, then it would be too late to carry out the plan because they couldn't kill the babies and make it look like something just natural happened. So the midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Now the word vigorous is a unique word in the Old Testament. In fact, this is such a unique word that this is the only place that it occurs in the entire Old Testament but it's very closely associated with just the vowel slightly different from another Hebrew word that's used that, that means wild animal. And when you read the commentaries about Exodus, the commentators bring this out. The midwives are playing into Pharaoh's prejudices towards the Jews. And they're saying, these Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They are animals. They give birth before the midwife even shows up. And given his prejudice against the Jews, Pharaoh buys their story, buys the report. And just think about it. Egypt compared to Israel. Egypt was the most advanced civilization in the world. They had advanced medicine. They had a great education system. Egyptian men were all clean shaven. They bathed daily, which was definitely not the practice of most of the ancient world. Certainly not the Jews. The Egyptians dressed in beautiful clothing. But who were the Jews? They were shepherds. They were despised by the Egyptians. They were inferior. They lived out in the fields. Even back when they first came to Egypt and Pharaoh, the Pharaoh at the time, gave them their own land, he gave them land that was downwind. They had beards. They smelled like wild animals. Egyptians didn't even eat with Jews. Did you know that? We know that even from the story of Joseph when his brothers came to visit. Joseph wouldn't even eat with his brothers. Egyptians didn't eat with Jews. And if you don't eat with someone and you don't associate with them, then you can dehumanize them and you can view them as inferior. I actually think this explains much of the racial division and racial tensions that we see here in St. Louis. People just don't know one another. They don't know people of other races. They don't have meals together. They're not in each other's homes. So therefore, you can dehumanize the other person and view them as inferior. You heard from Brad a little bit about some of the different nations all around here that he's working with. Did you know that Afton High School is 10 minutes from here? 10 minutes from our church. And I found out this week that for 43% of the students at Afton High School, English is not their first language. Isn't that incredible? 
But that's the way God has been bringing the worlds to us, as, as Brad shared. And Brad, we'll have to have you come back sometime and maybe preach a whole sermon and unpack some of the things you're involved in. Well, Pharaoh was quite willing to hold on to his prejudice towards the Jews. He believed the story of the midwives, so they were not punished. In fact, God blessed them for their obedience. Because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. This was a huge blessing. He gave them families. Well, we need to get on to the birth of Moses here this morning, but please do not miss how God used the faithfulness of the midwives to play such an important part of this story. The author is very intentional to include their role in the story of Exodus. Pharaoh was the most powerful person on earth, and the midwives had no power in Egyptian society. They were way down at the bottom. But God used them. And I want you to notice that they were doing their regular, ordinary job that they did every day. Did you, did you catch that? I mean, they're midwives. That's what they did. They're nurses of some sort in this area. They didn't have to quit their regular jobs and go off to be missionaries in order to be used by God in a powerful way. He took them right where they were, doing their regular jobs, and he used them to accomplish his purposes. And God is always ready to use the, the weakest members of society, the ones with the least power, if they will trust him, if they will be faithful to him. So when you feel like you're insignificant and you don't do some big thing for God that's going to make a huge difference, you need to know that God can use you right where you are in your faithful life to change the world. And that's exactly what he does in this story. The faithfulness of these two women saves countless lives. In fact, in Exodus 1 and 2, it is all women, as we continue on in the story too, with no power in society, who play the most prominent roles in bringing about God's plans. Our job is just to be faithful. God's job is to take our faithful service and use it to accomplish his purposes. And that's what he does so beautifully through these two women. Of course, Pharaoh doesn't just give up, right? <laughs> Pharaoh doesn't just throw in the towel and give up here. He is evil. And he hates God. And he will never stop trying to destroy God's people. He's tried enslaving them. That didn't work. Then he tried beating them with taskmasters. That didn't work. He tried secretly having all the baby boys killed. That didn't work either. So now he makes his murderous plans known to all. Pharaoh commanded all his people, every son that is born to the Hebrews, you shall cast into the Nile, but you shall let every daughter live. Why did he want to kill just the male children? Because boys will one day grow up and they will be part of the army. So no boys means eventually no army, no threat. And I think his bigger plan was that over time, if there were no boys and there were eventually no men, the Jewish women would be forced to marry the Egyptian men and they would assimilate into society. And that would solve all of his political problems right there. But behind all of this, really, is the enemy's desire that we see all through Scripture 
in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, and even beyond the time of the scriptures into the history of this world, the enemy's desire to destroy God's people and wipe them off the face of this earth. It is still his desire. So this is what is going on in Egypt when we come to the time of Moses' birth. Exodus 2. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. So this is the priestly class. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. So when things seemed their darkest in the land, God is at work to save his people. His plan? To have a baby born in secret and then to raise him up to be the one who will deliver his people out of Egypt. That's God's plan. God is so amazing. The things that he does in scripture are so amazing. This baby, sentenced to death by Pharaoh's decree, will become the very instrument that is used for bringing down Pharaoh. That's how God thinks of every little detail in putting a plan together. We, if we were God, I know if I was God, I would just want to send in the troops. I mean, we know that God has at least 12 legions of angels at his disposal that he could just send in, right? Jesus said that. He could have done that. The Father could have done that. He could have completely wiped out the Egyptians on the spot. That's what I think I would have done. I mean, people are living in slavery. They are dying. Babies are being thrown into the Nile River. But God is so patient in bringing about his plans. So patient in doing his work. And so Israel will have to wait another 80 years until they are delivered. And I'm curious this morning, as you think about things that you're trusting God for, things in your life, things in your family, maybe things with your children, maybe things in the church, things that you're praying about, things that we're together trusting God for, are we patient enough to let God be God and work out his plans? Because I fear sometimes we're too impatient and we bail out on the process and we miss God's blessing. We miss the work that he's doing. For us, if something doesn't change immediately, I mean, I prayed about it. We put a plan together and another week has gone by and God still hasn't done anything. So he's clearly not blessing us. He's clearly not for me. He's not blessing my family. And we bail out on the plan. So I hope this story encourages you to pray in faith and to wait patiently as God does his work in your life. I mean, imagine if you're an 18-year-old Israeli living in slavery and Pharaoh has all of your people enslaved and day after day you are suffering and babies are being thrown into the Nile. But you pray in faith and you feel God has heard my prayers and he will deliver his people. And, and you're confident. You know God will answer his prayers. But then nothing changes for 80 years? Think about that. So that means 79 years later, 
You were in high school. Now you're 97 years old and your people are still living in slavery and babies are still being thrown into the Nile. Surely God has forgotten his people. He's not answered his, these prayers. There's still no deliverer. Clearly God has abandoned us. He's just abandoned us. He's not with us. He's not blessing us. Clearly. We're still living in slavery. Listen, folks, we have to understand this. We, especially as Americans, we are so impatient. But when that 18-year-old was a senior in high school, God said, surely I have seen the affliction of my people, and I will deliver them from the hand of the Egyptians. Now, he would be 98 years old when God finally sent the tangible answer to his prayers. Do not grow impatient with God. God's plans are perfect. God's timing is perfect. But I'm telling you, it is not our timing. It is not. And we see this all throughout the scriptures. Why is God so patient in bringing about his plans? Why is God so patient? If God has a great work that he's doing in your life or he's doing in our church, why is he so patient in bringing it about? Why is he so patient here in bringing about this great work in Egypt? Because he is absolutely 100% committed to using people to accomplish his purposes. And so God's plan patiently unfolds as he waits for Moses to be born and then to spend 80 years grooming Moses to lead his people out of Egypt. And he does this through so many different hands of love that come along. One of them is Moses' mother. She hides Moses for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made of bulrushes. Now that's Egyptian papyrus. She takes the papyrus, she weaves it into a basket, and she covers it with tar and pitch to make it waterproof. And then she puts it in the river. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. Now the Nile, you may know, is one of the few rivers in the world that flows from south to north. It's actually the longest river in the world, over 4,000 miles long, and it's very wide and very dangerous at places. And there was Moses floating in a basket along the banks of the river. God's entire plan for setting his people free was floating up the Nile River in a papyrus basket. By the way, in placing her son into the Nile River, Moses' mom was engaging in an act of civil disobedience. Pharaoh had commanded, all the baby boys must go into the Nile River. Well, she put him in the Nile River. She put the child in this basket and placed it among the reeves by the river bank. But notice the tenderness of her action. She doesn't throw him in the Nile River as her own heart clearly was being broken. She took the basket and she gently placed it in the river. And really, I think her hands of love were taking her son and placing him in even greater hands of love. 
That's all she could do. Isn't, isn't that what all parents have to do with their children? I mean, at the end of the day, we can't really protect our children. We can't save them. All we can do is love them the best we can and place them into even greater hands. She loves her son with all of her heart, but she has to put him in God's hands. It was an act of faith that Moses placed her son in God's hands and she really let him go. Did you know Moses' mother is not even named until later in the book of Exodus? She's completely anonymous here. But for this act, she will later be recorded in Hebrews chapter 11 in the Faith Hall of Fame of the Bible. Isn't that beautiful? An anonymous woman, not even mentioned here, in the Hall of Fame of Faith in the Bible. God uses so many amazing women here to protect Moses. Amazingly, I think maybe the most amazing of all, one of them was Pharaoh's own daughter. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. So Pharaoh's daughter opens up the basket and she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She didn't hear the baby crying. She saw the baby, saw that he was crying, and she took pity on him. The moment Pharaoh's daughter peeked inside that basket and saw that precious baby, compassion, gripped her heart. In that moment, it didn't matter that her father was the one who gave the orders that all the baby boys should be cast into the Nile and killed. In that moment, it didn't matter. It didn't matter that she had been raised in a home of prejudice and that these were inferior people who weren't even human beings. None of that mattered in that moment. She had been brought up to hate these people. But it didn't matter because Pharaoh's daughter, and never forget this about any person you meet, even the most evil people in our society, Pharaoh's daughter was made in the image of God. She's made in the image of God. And when she found herself looking down at the tears of a baby who was also made in the image of God, something very special happened in her heart. We really see her humanity here. And God did something that he has done countless, countless times. He used the tears of a baby to touch the heart of a woman. God's image is so powerful in people. She, she just is a human being and she cannot look on this beautiful baby and kill him. By the way... <laughs> This is why Planned Parenthood actually trains their ultrasound technicians to position the screen of the ultrasound in such a way that the mothers cannot see the picture of the ultrasound of their own baby. They're trained to do that because they know if the mother will, would actually just see her baby, 
Statistically, this is borne out. Almost every time, she will choose life, even if she went in and planning to get an abortion. The image of God inside Pharaoh's daughter is so powerful She's touched by the tears of this baby. And she too is a hero in this story. She really is. God uses the most unlikely people, doesn't he? Can you believe this? Pharaoh's daughter took one child who was of a different race and was condemned to die, and she provided life and a future to this child. And what a future. What a future she provided. See, I think sometimes we get overwhelmed by all the needs out there. Our hearts want to help. We want to do something. We want to reach all these people who are away from Christ and help all these people. And it's so overwhelming because there's so much suffering and so much poverty and so much pain. So we think we can't do anything. We just simply get overwhelmed. But there are countless small things that we can do that God will use in big ways. In six weeks, Pastor Elijah from Hands of Love Ministry is going to be here. And he's going to share on Saturday night and Sunday morning. He's going to share with us many of the things that they're doing and ways that we can be involved and help and and things that can make a huge difference. And we know they make a difference. Some of you are sponsoring children in Uganda, orphans. I think there's 20 orphans that are being sponsored from people in Christ Community Church right now. And that little small thing for us changes a child's life forever. There's many things like that. So if you sponsor a child, what do you do? Same thing Pharaoh's daughter did. You're taking a child from another race who was condemned to die, and you are giving that child life and a future and hope. You heard just a taste of the stuff that Brad's involved with, with multicultural ministries. I bet there's a lot of small ways people could come alongside and make a huge difference in that ministry. Later this year, you'll hear from our missions committee um, different ideas, the ways that we can be involved in the community in many different ways. You don't have to be a leader like Moses to make a difference. There are many virtually unknown, faithful people who were absolutely essential to God's plan unfolding in the Exodus. Think of all the people we've talked about today. The midwives who refused to follow Pharaoh's order and many lives were saved. Moses' mother who faithfully protected her son and put him in God's hands in the Nile River. Pharaoh's daughter who took in Moses and raised him as her own child. All of these people did small things that God used to do a very big thing. One of the biggest things in the history of this world, God did through their faithfulness. He set his people free from their slavery and bondage. Because of their faithfulness, Moses would grow up and he would be the king's grandson. And he would be educated in the finest Egyptian schools. He would be trained to be a politician and a court official and a lawyer and a diplomat. In other words, Moses was actually receiving the very training that he would need to to receive in order to overthrow Pharaoh. That's how God does his plan. But all of this, all of this story is really just a small story in comparison to the big deliverance story of the Bible. Moses is just a deliverer, but he wasn't the deliverer. 
the Savior was still to come. And centuries after Moses, God would send yet another deliverer. He would send a Savior. And as amazing as the entire story of the Exodus is, it is just a foreshadowing to the big Exodus that was to come when God would set his people free from slavery and bondage. And it is just a foreshadowing of the greater Moses that was to come as once again, God would patiently wait until just the right time for his plan to take root. See, more than a thousand years would go by. Close to 1,500 years would go by. But then God would send another baby into the world. And once again, there was another king, another insecure, power-hungry king who determined to kill all the baby boys. But once again, God would work through ordinary, regular people and he would spare the life of this special baby boy who would come to lead his people. And this baby would grow up and he would deliver us all from slavery and sin and death and bondage and set us free on the most amazing exodus of all. Ultimately, it is his hands that have rescued us. And now we have the opportunity to serve him as rescued rescuers. Let's pray to him. Lord Jesus, what you have done is so amazing, so incredible. You have loved us. You have faithfully saved your people and delivered us from bondage. And Lord, even as we think of our own lives, there are so many people who have been involved in pointing us to you and nurturing us along the way and sharing their testimony. So many hands of love that have touched our lives. Lord, would you help us to do the same for other people? Help us to be faithful in the small things, just right where we live every day, right in our jobs. Help us to trust you and be faithful. And then, Lord, would you use us, use our little small acts of obedience to accomplish great work for your kingdom. Lord, we're trusting in you because we can't pull plans together and accomplish the kinds of things that you can do. Our very best plans are very short-sighted. So Lord, our plan is to follow you and to just find ways to come alongside your plan and be part of this great work that you are doing right here in this community. Lord, help us to be faithful. Help us to trust in you. And we pray that you will accomplish great things. Because you love this community even more than we do. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.